So thank you everyone for coming. Um, I'm Ken Albala in the history department and I teach the history of food and I write about food. So this is kind of exactly in my wheelhouse. Um, and we're going to have a discussion uh, between me and Lydia Fox, who's in um, geology and environmental sciences. And we've, I think, been here, you, you got here a little before I did, just a few years, but we've both been here more than a quarter of a century. <laughs> and most of our discussions take place at like Super Bowl games <laughs> or, in, or in like meetings. And we very rarely actually get to sit down and have a serious discussion in the ways that our, our topics and our interests actually intersect. But what we've decided to do is I'm gonna just sort of introduce why this happened. Um, we, can, we can focus on meat in general or even narrow our focus down to talk about cattle and cows because that's really the, the big, biggest culprit, you could say, in the modern food system. Um, so let me just give a little background to that and then Lydia will come in and talk about um, how and why she became a vegetarian. And if you haven't figured this out from the start, I'm gonna take the position in defense of meat and Lydia's going to, going to talk about the reason she gave it up. Um, so this, I'm getting just a picture of Elizabeth here, but maybe if you, um, um, I'm not sure why, I'll go back to gallery view, it doesn't matter. Okay, so to start with, we, you know, have been eating cows for a very long time um, in terms of human history and diet. Um, and it happens bef long before we domesticated cattle. You know, in, in, across the Eurasian continent, there were aurochs, who were the big ancestors of cows. And they were domesticated actually in two separate places. There's one type that was domesticated in um, the Middle East, in what's called the Fertile Crescent. And those are the shorthorn cattle that become, you know, when we picture a cow, we think of those. There's another kind that's longhorn that was probably domesticated in India. Um, about the same time, and those end up in Africa also, but through the trade routes. Um, but for most of our history, we haven't eaten a whole lot of them. In other words, they've always been far more valuable for their milk and as traction animals, because if you take a male steer and you castrate it, you get an ox, which is a really big, strong animal that is great for pl pulling a plow. It provides you fertilizer because it poops everywhere. And it's really, you know, fits very nicely into a complex agricultural system where you're growing plants and you, that forms the basis of your diet. It will be a grain. And then you have just a little cattle to provide these other services and to provide things like leather, if it's a cow or wool, if it's sheep. And so it's part of a, a um, sort of complex agricultural system. Now, that is the rule all the way up, you could say, into like the... 18th, 19th century, when a couple of different things happen. One is they start breeding these cattle to be different. Um, people through conscious selective breeding, not this is long after domestication, this is, you know, 2000, several thousand years later, um, begin to specialize in just milk producing cattle. Um, and they're the ones you'd recognize as Jer Guernsey or Jersey or Holsteins. And they get, I mean, a, a mod, like a, cow in the 18th century would have produced about a gallon of milk every day. Um, now in an industrial sort of setup, they produce about 12 gallons. So it's so we've clearly very, very much changed, changed the animal itself. And other breeds are for meat, the things like Angus, or, um, you know, they're, they're just a different, they're bred very differently to serve very different purposes. And most importantly, is their bread for meat production, which is, which is different, right? They're not part of a more complex system. They're bred in larger numbers. And for most of our eating them in that way, they were grass fed, meaning you'd have to let them out onto the hillsides where they could munch on grass. And, and people are making this argument um, to this day that there are some places that we really can't grow crops. They're just not suitable soils and suitable amount of rain water and everything. So, a, Cattle is a very, very efficient way to use grass, which we can't digest, our systems can't because we, we're not ruminants, you know, and they can digest that and then they turn into food for us. So it's kind of an efficient way to do it. But all of that changes when we start growing food just to feed the cows <laughs> or cattle in large numbers. And then you're growing, you know, corn or soy or other fodder 
and raising these in feedlots. And the feedlot, you all know what this is, right? You drive down I-5 and you see, you can smell it before you see it. It's the smell of blood really in the, in the air. And you see thousands upon thousands of cows that have begun on grass, but then they're finished on corn. So they get really fat. They you know put on a ton of weight and they sell them for more. And, um, and then as you probably know that, well, the reason that happened is that's even possible is transport, right? I and mean, you need railroads to get meat from place to place and the ability to, in fact, in the 19th century, they were actually just railroad cars with ice. <laughs> they would just ship them and send them to central, um, they would slaughter them in one central place, you know, for pigs that was Cincinnati, for cattle it was um, the stockyards in Chicago, and then they'd ship it elsewhere. You know, they'd start them in the Midwest, they'd make, make it through those cities and then go to the East or elsewhere, but you can never raise that much cow um, without having transport systems uh, and, and refrigeration, and then the ability to sort of the food network that gets them into your supermarket and puts it in a package so that you don't you forget it's a cow entirely. Like the, we're probably the first century that really doesn't doesn't have intimate connection to, to, to our food source that that you know thinks of meat as a, something in a package in a plastic package, not as a, a creature. And I think that allows us to do things to them that other generations probably wouldn't. Um, so, so, my, so my point, what I'm, I'm just gonna sort of launch into, into our discussion with this, is that our modern food system is an aberration, that it's not meat inherently something bad with meat for us, or even I would argue ethically, I think using animals, we can get into this point if you want, but that, but that it's, it's really the modern system that's, that's messed up and and, you know, and I think probably, you know, we're going to come from very different angles, maybe even end up at the same place, I think, but, but it's the amount of meat that we eat. Um, and the fact that as income rises globally, the first thing people want to eat is when they, they, you know, the grains are basic nutrition, maybe 30% of people barely get enough nutrition. So they're really eating rice or corn or wheat or whatever it may be. Once you pass that threshold, the first thing you add to your diet is more meat. Um, and so developing nations have, you know, crave it for good reason. Okay. I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Um, so I, and again, yeah, my uh, rejection of meat is a rejection of the industrialized way that we do meat. Um, I read a book when I was in college. So right. back when I was, you know, forming all those synapses and being a critical thinker, and I, I have to say, I come from a meat eating family. My grandmother's parents raised cows um, and, and steak. My dad liked his steak, um, just barely stopped mooing. You know, he really liked a nice, juicy, uh, rare steak. Um, and I read this book called Diet for a Small Planet by Francis Mord LePay. So this was again back in, you know, back when dinosaurs were running around in the late Jurassic, I read this book. Um, and it just opened my eyes to the inefficiencies of this industrialized agriculture and how much energy and how much water was going into producing um, the meat. And the fact that we were then diverting all these grains which could be used, either the grains could be used to feed people or the land could be used to grow nutritious food for people. And we were just, it seemed as though it was just um, an inefficient use and it was an, a waste of energy and a waste of water and was having a big impact on the environment. And of course, this is back um, before global warming was really um, a significant topic um, of discussion. And then as I have continued as a vegetarian, so I became a vegetarian, I will say I'm a pescatarian, I will eat some fish, um, not farmed fish, but I will eat wild fish. Um, but it's just gotten worse. The whole, as I observed it, we just have so much meat. Um, that is like the standard. So people just have fast food will drive through and grab a hamburger um, as if somehow that is nutrition and it's not nutrition. Um, so it's, the other thing I found is that my health is probably, I know it's better than my parents was, my cholesterol is really low. So when I go to my doctor and does the annual tests, she will comment on the fact that, you know, my blood tests always look really good. What is it that I'm doing? And um, it is because I'm, you know, I think it's because I'm a vegetarian. Um, it's, 
so that was my rejection. Well, I guess the video would like to be able to mute their mic. Um, so it was a rejection of that, um, what I felt was an inefficient use of the land. And I really still feel like we just spend so much land, we use so much land, energy, and water just to support an industrialized agricultural system in growing all this meat. And it just seems to me that um, that the, we've just skewed things wrong and that more meat is not healthier for people. Some meat, yes, I, I would argue that some meat, in some cases, if you don't have access to other good protein sources, some meat is essential. But, you know, but if you go back to at least my grandparents' generation, they weren't eating beef as a regular meal. It was a special meal. You might have a roast on Sunday, but you were not eating meat, certainly not beef, on a daily, multiple times a day basis. So I just think that we've just, we, we've skewed things in part because we were able to grow corn in dense amount. Yeah. Then you have so to we also, have we also to subsidize that, don't we? I mean, we the government pays people to grow the corn and soy, which largely goes to feed the cattle. So it's the states, the fact that the way our government is set up, we are paying, our tax money is going to the people who ultimately that fee fodder will end up in, in cattle, right? But we and that's got why it's there. So cheap. But I would say we got there because we started to become dependent on all that beef. So we had the 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 ability to grow lots and lots of corn, and then we have to have a market for it. So oh well we could feed it to beef and fatten them up and create that. So it's sort of become this vicious right. circle. But if, the, if we had never sort of allowed those states the political power to subsidize the grain in the first place, then beef would be a lot more expensive. People would eat less of it, and we would and those those farmers would have to grow other things. They would grow vegetables locally or wheat or whatever whatever they would grow to feed humans. And then ultimately, it was it was a mindset of Americans in particular, and and you could argue some other places in the world that thought meat is food. That should be the center of the plate. Protein has got to be the, and then the other stuff kind of is an addition. You put grains on the plate or you put vegetables on the plate. And that's a very American way of thinking of things. Right. And the problem yeah. is then the, the developing world looks to us as we are the ultimate, you know, right. we want to be like them. And so now they're copying us. So when you see that the meat consumption is going up in some of these drastically, um, in some of these countries is frightening. It's like, why do they want to have our cholesterol problems? You know, right. why, why are they chasing that? And let me just say, there's another, there's another issue here is um, it actually comes down to the cycling back to the climate change. Um, developing countries with who happen to live in rainforest areas um, don't see a value to their rainforest. So they are and urged often to cut those trees down and plant grass. And therefore, then they can graze cows and sell those cows to McDonald's or any other, you know, meat, meat consuming company. But the problem is the soils in the tropics are lousy, you know, in order to get anything yep. to grow, you have to add all these fertilizers to it. So it's sort of this, again, we get them more in debt because they have to then get stuff from us to make those that land um, profitable. So it's just, it's just become yeah. this vicious cycle that is leading to planetary destru destruction in my mind. That's that's a global problem. But let's okay. let's come to the question of health because we have we know that in this country the the focus on dietary fats and saturated fats was really the invention of sort of the the glorification of the Mediterranean diet, Ansel Keys in the 20th century and most of the advice about fat was wrong. You know, the, the fact you can't take fat out of your diet and that unless you're eating a massive amount of saturated fat, your body uses that in very productive ways, you know, and it's good. So, so like saying, you know, the, in our minds, we still kind of say, oh, eating fat makes you fat and red meat is bad from the seventies, you know? And I think we're, we're still not over that, that sort well, of well, conception. But you've got people who, because of, they may live in food deserts, they are eating. Yeah. They're eating, you know, fast food, which is, you know, mostly meat, mostly beef based, three meals a day often. You know, they could be going and getting that breakfast, you know, yeah. sandwich, which has a sausage on it and the hamburger at lunch 
and the you know double cheeseburger for dinner. So I, I do think that it is also that's not healthy. And that again, it's part of our industrialized food system where we've just you know made that easy and made it much harder for people to get real food. That's true, but that's that's a different issue entirely. So if if there is I mean, I don't know, why wouldn't we subsidize like a grocery store? Why wouldn't we subsidize a place that has fresh vegetables right. so that if someone at least had a choice, they would say, okay, I don't have to eat at McDonald's. Right. Um, and McDonald's is not going to put stuff like that in, you know, in on their menu because they know it doesn't sell. They have to, they have a business. Right. Um, so would you go back to the environmental issue? Because this is something that that obviously we have methane gas from cows farting, farts basically. And the you know cutting down rainforests and all that, but but is there a problem with small scale cattle ranching that happens on pasture that really is not good for agriculture at all? No, because I, well, cows were not cows don't eat corn naturally. That is not a natural right. food source for cows, and it makes them sick. So not only does that make them belch and fart more, which produces more methane but they actually have to pump antibiotics into the cows to keep them from getting sick because they're eating food that's, A, they're densely packed in a feedlot, right, but they're right, also right. eating food that, that's not good for them. So yeah, I mean, and again, it sort of comes back to, yeah, it's great that we could grow a whole bunch of corn in a small area, but do we need that much corn? I mean, that's the issue. Could we figure out another way to grow good high density food, you know, um, a good high density, high nutrition density food on the land that we're just spending, you know, just so much land and space to grow all that corn. Okay, so let's let's address maybe the ethical issue because I know this is something that motivates people that somehow animals are close to us, they have feelings, and that you know we're basically abusing them, you know, or using them for our own ends and our own purposes, and. The way we kill them is, you know, totally mechanized. And even though there are some people who try to do it ethically, it's by and large, you're still killing animals, right? I, I, yeah, I have a friend who won't eat anything with eyes. And of course, then you get into the hilarious, <laughs> what about potatoes? Um, <laughs> yeah, well, but, but you know, but let's, but let's think about that because it's very anthropocentric. It means that the closer the animal is to us, the more we value it and the more we should keep it nice because you know my cat's sitting right here next to me and I wouldn't eat him but right. but if it's an animal I can divorce myself or even a plant I mean we, right. we're not we're thinking sort of nature doesn't care what you know level of intelligence you are our molecules get recycled all the time and all nature is really about using other beings for your own sustenance right. regardless of, of what level you have to kill to eat you know, right so not, I I would argue, let's go to deer, for example, because I, I don't think people hunt cows naturally. Um, but deer, <laughs> no wild ones you, know, left. you can go to the Northeast and the deer have proliferated to the fact that they're eating everybody's gardens. They are yes. a pest yep. now. And yet, uh, so I, I have a cabin in Northern Maine and the people who live around, who live full time in that area, that is their meat source. They kill a deer, they get a deer, and that means they've got a freezer full of meat. That doesn't cost them money other than buying the, the hunting tag and if they weren't killing those deer the deer would starve and i would much rather you know that i think i would imagine that a hunter's bullet is a quick death versus starving yeah if they run out of food in the winter yeah so they I, do I, and where, where my where i grew enough. up in, in new jersey is now overrun by deer also and you can't hunt there because it's all suburban houses you know right. but they go in people's backyards right so so the so you're not objecting to the idea of animal welfare, of animal rights. That's of, not why I gave up meat. No, I gave right. up meat for an environmental standpoint, not from an, but I do know vegetarians who did give up meat for an ethical standpoint. I have no argument with them. I just, although I will use the, you know, I think some hunting can be good and I just use that deer example. Um, so no, for me, it was purely an environmental, an environmental choice. And I realized that one person giving up meat doesn't change the environmental impact of the meat industry. Right. But I do try to advocate for people to take a critical look at, at the, you know, at sort of it's gotten skewed way out of way out of proportion. Okay. So, so let me ask a personal question then. Yeah. Do you miss the flavor? No. Like no, I realized that I actually, when it, it was easy to give up 
and I didn't miss it. You know, I, I just, I never really loved it. Wow, because so I tried, uh, just for an experiment once, I was writing about fasting in Lent, and I said, let me just see what would happen if I can go 40 days, do a proper medieval fast with no meat, eggs, cheese, dairy products. I gave up alcohol too, which was the hardest part, honestly, especially because it was, I know you couldn't believe that, especially because it was during St. Patrick's Day, and you know, the people in Boston get a dispensation, and I got through it, and I thought, I'm probably going to feel better at the end of this, I'm going to be, you know, exactly the opposite. I felt like shit. It was just, just like so physically debilitated. And I tried to get protein in my body with beans and with, you know, other things, but um, maybe I'm just like so dependent on it. And maybe it's just a purely aesthetic thing for me that, that if you give, if you give me a choice, the thing I will eat always, um, you know, I maybe eat it, I eat meat a couple of times a week, you know, and, and not a whole lot of it, but it's, but when I think of like what is good in my mind, it just it's like I crave blood. That's, that's yeah. all there is to it. And that's just it. Is I, I I never loved it. And I, I had a story, you know. So after I'd been a vegetarian for about ten years, I was uh, on the market for academic jobs, and I um, flew to a school back east. And the department chair had me over for dinner, and hadn't bothered to ask about my dietary <laughs> preferences. And served this fabulous for them roast and of course it had been 10 years since i'd eaten meat i was in this awkward situation of i don't want to offend my host because they're going to decide whether or not to get a job um, yeah. it was awful it was absolutely awful wow wow <laughs> i sort of like picked at it and it had been so long since i'd eaten it i just didn't have the way to digest it anymore you know it's just it was awful it was just, oh interesting how very interesting so you don't crit so you're not motivated to try impossible burgers or no. the um you know ones that are and I don't understand, I actually don't understand the like tofurkey and the fake meat. It's like, I don't want meat. So I don't want anything. Right. I'm not, I have no interest in anything that is like meat. So yeah, no, it, it doesn't. Right. So, so what, so what probably, what motivates those people? Because I have to say, I've tried the Impossible Burger right when it came out and I cooked it side by side with beef. It, they're very, very close. And, you know, it's the leg hemoglobin in the, in the plant that, bleeds and gives it a similar texture and and it's a heme ion so it tastes kind of like iron you know in a way that is um is very close to a regular burger mm -hmm. but it's really really highly processed and so so the part where i balk is like well if i'm going to buy this pound of ground beef or the, and it's a little more expensive but not ridiculously so i'd rather just eat meat and just eat it more rarely you know Exactly. So my, my, the way I eat is as least the only, I like to eat what I process myself. So like I will cook beans and I will cook grains and I like to put it all together, but yeah. I don't buy packaged food. I just don't buy things that other people have processed for me. I'd rather just eat as close to, you know, as simple. Right. But, but people are sort of lured by this idea of convenience and they think, oh, if it's easier, it's got to be better. And why should I go through this labor when the, the company will do it for me? I'll pay more. Right. And and I, I am totally with you that, that if yeah. you're going to eat anything, cook it yourself. At least right. you know what goes into it, and right. you know, and at I, some level. And I love to cook, and I would say that being a vegetarian has given me like just, I'm looking for, I'm always looking for new things that um, are interesting, and I just, I have a really wide, di my diet is very varied, um, and I eat, and I'm healthy, um, and. Uh, so. Well, give me an idea. Give me an idea of what's fun for you to cook, because because I'm because I'm you know. Well, just I, finishing a cookbook right now so it's kind of and, and it's gone totally off the deep end and i'm i'm finding i'm eating a lot of things that i wouldn't eat so much i'm eating more butter than i ever had in my life because there's like oh, sauce that. and shit like that and it's just like <laughs> i gained 10 pounds in the past month just eating this but, but so, give me an idea of what, what your, your so i i like. got an i got an instant pot several years ago and it it just changed things I like do too. oh my god i can actually cook beans and grains eat quickly and easily and i don't have to yep. mind the stove and so i do curries i do stews um i you know i'm like trying thai food and indian food and moroccan and i just you know i'm always on the hunt for new recipes and i try sort of new things um i'm home alone yeah. so my freezer fills up with all my leftovers <laughs> cool. do you, do you <laughs> find the vegetable vegetables are expensive though right i mean they're not they're well, I, you're right, and I am fortunate enough that I, although I, I, um, I get vegetables delivered, I have a, I'm part of a CSA, um, oh. and I have a little bit of a challenge because it's coming down from the Cape Valley, so I have a, 
a moral issue with the I've, transportation related to that. I've been on that farm. It's it's lovely and met the guy who runs it, which is yeah. So, so there's part of my, you know, like I'll make an environmental choice, but I'm also, you know, impacting the transportation, although they're delivering to a whole bunch of us um, yeah. in the middle of the night. But um, even if you could buy bought stuff at the farmer's market, it may have traveled from Fresno, you know, or something. Right. Um, yeah. And so I, um, yes, I, I feel lucky that I have the resources to be able to afford vegetables, um, you know, but I buy my grains in bulk and so, I, have, I have a whole pantry full of big jars of beans and grains. And it's just kind of like, ooh, what am I going to mix together tonight? So isn't this kind of also a matter of social class and accessibility to food? Is that vegetables really are a privilege because they're they are more expensive and you know, and that's what's screwed up about our that's what is screwed up about the yeah. situation is that we have made meat cheap, and we have made yeah. vegetables expensive and that is just totally wacko. I mean, you look at how much farmland now we've turned over to almonds. Now, I I like yeah. my almonds. I like my almond milk, but when I first moved to Stockton, you know, they were trying to push almonds, you know, it's the guys standing there, please just buy a can a week, right? <laughs> right. Now everybody does almond everything and yeah. that land is not being used to grow, of course, because the farmer gets less money for growing row crops, which is, you know, than they do for growing almonds, which use so much more water. So this just, we right, right, right. really messed up our environmental system. In my mind. So let's let's think of, of if we were if we were now um, you can be president, I'll be vice president, and <laughs> we get to change the policy. Okay, and yeah. and we're sitting down in the Oval Office and thinking, okay, what's the first thing we do that's going to shift the priority? And obviously, we can't change people's minds culturally because they like meat and they want to eat it. But how would we how would we succeed in a way that Michelle Obama tried very hard and, and didn't? You know, and she ended up watering down her whole whole message. If we could give political clout to the to the air to the farmers, the farming regions, that would encourage growing a wider variety of crops. You know, if we could just stop subsidizing corn and maybe subsidize regular vegetables. I mean, I, I'm not, and you know, I haven't really thought through because I'm, I have. They're so not subsidized now. No, if you grow broccoli, you're on your own. Right. Totally. And, and, but if you grow tons amount of corn, which we don't need, and the only way we use that corn is to feed it to cows. So, and we make, you know, it all just, it, you know, follow the money, basically. It's all right. down to money. So what if we just for the sake of efficiency decided that we were going to use the cows much more efficiently and not just want to eat steak, but, but encourage people to eat, you know, the tails and the, you know, the other parts. Oh yeah, I, I and, grew up with my mother. We ate tongue sandwiches. I mean, you know, I hated the them. Best part of the animal. But totally. you know, we don't use anything other than you know the 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 stuff that goes into burgers. It seems. I mean, I really think it's just my worry is that we've gone so far down this line that there's just I don't know how we walk people back from this expectation that you eat meat multiple times a day. I just I don't. I wish we could change that and make eating vegetables cool, you know, like eating grains yes. and rice to be cool rather than something that's just marginalized. I, I you know, we could say it's coming, I'm, I'm speaking from a position of social, social privilege, but yeah. I think what I, I really think my, my food bill is so much lower than the average food bill because I'm just doing grains and rice and vegetables. I'm not, I mean, meat, does cost something and it costs more than what I'm eating. Yeah, it's about the same as vegetables. In the global market, I just heard a, 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 a parent, grains are very cheap, obviously, in comparison. So if you know the, the global, I think to feed a person that takes like a dollar fifty in most places of the world, if you're marginally just getting the barest required nutrition, but the vegetables and the meat are about they're they're both 30%, but your protein, 40%. Your protein sources are cheaper, you know. Yeah. Okay, so Elizabeth is, is telling us that we have about a few minutes left, but do okay. people have questions that they want to ask us? We can we can go down any other yeah. route. Um, what are, I know there's been a whole mess of chat in here, but if you wanted to, um, if someone has a specific question, put it in the chat and maybe we'll be able to address it. Um, Efficient use of our livestock, says, says um, Samson, who's in my class, is um, 
knowing how to cook those things, I think, is very important. And and it's just a, that's just a matter of education. You know, people think steak on grill, that's it, or hamburger. Um, but you know, being able to cook other parts is. Um, yeah, so this question about halal meat from a vegetarian point of view, again, my, um, I don't know enough about what is the requirements for halal meat and kosher meat. I don't, you know, I'm just speaking from, from ignorance then, um, but because I believe that has more of an ethical issue rather than, you yeah. know, for, for me, it's an environmental. And, and I have thought, well, I could, you know, buy beef from these farms that it's all grass fed and it's small scale and all of that but again i don't love meat so i hadn't even thought of yeah it. I, so you know i did for a while and i gave it a shot um to and i've eaten grass-fed meat and my neighbors right over there across the way um have a ranch and so i've met the cows i've you know been there and i've actually i have never slaughtered a, a cow but i have butchered pigs and deer and things like that and um I think knowing where the animal comes from is kind of important. Knowing, you know, it, how it's treated and how it's fed and everything. But here's the weird thing is grass-fed meat doesn't actually taste very good. <laughs> it's, it's much tougher. It's, we're used to corn-fed meat. And especially if you like that, like that sort of soft texture and tenderness, right. um, grass-fed beef is kind of chewy and it's different texture entirely. But there's a question in here about how would we get enough protein? And I, I definitely don't, I'd want to diffuse the myth that somehow meat is the best source of protein because no. I get plenty of protein. No. I get yeah. plenty of protein. You have to be a little bit creative about what you combine and what and making sure that you eat a varied diet. Yeah. But yeah. Um, giving up meat doesn't mean you give up protein at all. It's beans. There's a couple of amino acids that you have to be careful to, to get mm -hmm. if you're a vegan, uh, especially. And there are other sources for those nutritional yeasts and things like that. Um, Daniel, who's a student of mine, is asking about the agriculture of avocados. <laughs> and I'm not sure where that's, what that has to do with the topic, but it's avocados use a whole lot of water too. And, and you know, so do a lot of vegetables. And so it's not, I think if we just say meat is the culprit in our environmental problems about agriculture, we're missing the boat. Because it's right. really also about chemical fertilizers and runoff and, and a million other ways we could be growing things more right. efficiently, organically. Um, and, you know, a, a, an avocado doesn't produce methane. No, well, no. my hilarious <laughs> story, I was in graduate school in Santa Barbara and what, and somebody had an avocado ranch. Now coming from the East Coast, the only, when I hear ranch, I think of cattle and cowboys and, and, you know, and so I'm thinking, how, what do they go out and lasso the avocados? It was, you know, before I understood that California uses the term ranch for just about anything. Yeah. Uh, but that was my, yeah, yeah. no, I mean, I, any food that is being, you know, if it consumes, particularly in California, if it consumes a lot of water, it's problematic. And if it consumes and we're growing more of it because people, just because they want it, and it consumes a lot of water, we have to think about that. Yeah. You know, yeah. The whole so, almond so, industry has screwed up the California Central Valley water system because yeah, yeah. they can't fallow them in the time of a drought. And so, you know, we're just, we're using too much water. Yeah, Lise is asking um, a question about allergies. And yeah, there, there's, there's a genetic allergen to fava beans, favism that since some people have mm -hmm. um, yep. lupins, you know, so allergies are a big problem. And I think the more, you know, uh, people argue that we have more allergies nowadays because of the way we eat and um, we don't expose people to allergens very, very early on. Apparently, you know, you can't even bring a peanut butter sandwich to school, send a kid because someone in the class might have an allergen. And so no one's exposed to it and they develop them that might be, you know, the chemicals in our diet. It might be, a, a, people have argued a lot of different factors that increase allergies. There's a question here about the line between a lot of water and just enough water. Um, and my, in my mind, certainly in California, if it's a crop that could be fallowed in the case of a drought, then it's, then that's okay. But if we have pushed a big crop that cannot exist, you know, you can't just fallow right, the right. fields. And but the almonds are grown on such an enormous scale that they I, need that water. I, if you go to Spain, they're dry farmed. The, the almond groves have always been there. And in dry years, they don't have a whole lot of almonds. That right. would ruin the industry here. But they're using water that was meant to be water delivered in an excess right. water year, and they're using it so that they need it all the time every year. So that's that's where I my dividing line is. That's right, and and 
it's not a global thing. It's my mind of understanding the water situation in California. Sure, and we now do grow more than 80% of the world's almonds are, are right well, here. We've, we've created the market for almonds, you know. Right. It's a lot more almond consumption now than there used to be because we've, again, we grow a lot Some of it. They make a lot of money and they've created this world market. And the Almond Board of California, which is right there in Modesto. So, so we're getting off topic. So yeah. let's focus back, get back to our, our cows. Um, because, you know, you could argue that cow's milk is actually a much more efficient and better way to get protein than almond milk. They're both delicious, you know, right. from an aesthetic point of view. I love both of them, not, not the stuff you buy in the store. If you make almond milk yourself, yeah. it's very easy to do. Right. But, you know, but I think if you think of cat, cow, and how much milk it produces, not right. on the industrial scale that we have now, but if you were to have in the backyard of that lovely Gothic building you have there, is, right. that, is that Cambridge? It looks like- I don't know, I, I forget where I got College it College in Cambridge, because that, <laughs> that building on the left is Christopher Wren. And there's a meadow on the, right, right on the other side of the river with cow, cows on it. But if you have a handful of cows in the back of your house, maybe a little cow, I can have a little cow in my backyard, milk it every day, get a gallon or two, that'd be fine, right? right. I mean, I eat a lot of yogurt, um, so that's, you know, I do, and I try to get my milk from farms that um, are, you know, not mass producing it. So, you know, I'm just, I try to walk my walk with environmental concerns. Yeah. Okay. But again, that's, that's, a, that's a privilege that I have because I have the resources. I do understand that yeah. I speak from that, but I also think that we as a society have just, our priorities are screwed up. If it's easier to get a hamburger than it is to get salad on a daily basis, we, we've, we're messed up. You know, we yeah, should- Or at least to have everyone have access to yeah. enough of all of those things right. that exactly. if you make a choice, and I, and I think, you know, some people have argued if we made beef a lot more expensive, let's make it difficult for growers, right. then people will just eat less of it and they'll, they'll naturally turn to right. other, other food sources. Right. Um, right. And it is, it is totally a social class issue, um, mm -hmm. Neil, it says right there. And it's the opposite of all human history. Right. For all human history, it was the wealthy people who got to eat meat and everyone else lived on vegetables happily, right. presumably. And now it's turned around so that the meat is the cheap stuff and the, and the you know, people who have the, who can't afford other things turn to, to hamburger meat, which is cheap. It's like, you know, two ninety nine a pound. Right. You can feed a family with that. Yeah, and, and but just eating meat is not sufficient nutrition for anybody. I'm not arguing that it's necessarily meat necessarily bad, but it's it, it can't be all that you eat. You know, if you're just no, 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 of course. But but you know, a small the way most cultures deal with it is you have a small amount of meat, a couple of ounces, in a with a bowl of rice or right. you know corn or on a tortilla or whatever it may be, and that's um, that's very different than putting meat at the center of the plate and eating you know a, a steak. Imagine sitting down with someone and eating, you know, a half a pound or a pound of steak at one point, which is, um, right. and there is a diet, you know, this, uh, James this Rocha said there's a diet where you eat only meat. Well, of course, you know, the, the, the keto, super keto diets and, and the paleo diets, which pretend to be something like the paleolithic, which is not true. I mean, no, people have no. never been completely carnivorous. Yeah. Cats, yes, humans can eat everything. Um, that, uh, you know, that does cause other problems, you know, apart from the fact, apart from all the other things we've been arguing. Um, right. Yes, and we, we are getting to 3D printed steak. Um, <laughs> so, you know, yeah. well, did there... Did, did we want to try, drive that poll or are we running out of time? We yeah, were run gonna... the poll. Let's run the poll. Just, we have, we have two minutes left. So um, yeah. Elizabeth has the poll, I think. Okay, there we go. We've launched. So go ahead and vote. Just, just out of interest, um, how many people eat meat, how many people are vegetarian, and how many are vegan. And then, I, then there was another poll. So the there's um, 85, 87 percent of people have voted. 89. There's we're, okay. We're almost all there. So 85 percent of the audience here eats meat. 13% are vegetarian, 2%, one person is, uh, is a vegan. And let's go to the next poll and see whether it is, and that actually matches the US profile pretty well, the population. About, about 10, 12% are vegetarian and about 2% are vegan. 
that's kind of interesting. I wouldn't have wouldn't have expected our group of people to, to match that. I would have expected more vegetarians actually. Um, and here's the second poll, just just to see out of interest um, whether you're doing that for animal welfare, environmental concern, health, or for religious reasons. Obviously, if you're you know Hindu, you would not going to eat cow, <laughs> um, or if you're um, you know they're Buddhist, strict Buddhist, you wouldn't. Um, and so the reason people have done this, it's it's a divided. It's mostly animal welfare. That's interesting. Um, well, I know it's about. A, I think it's about a mix here between animal welfare and health yeah. and environment, because we don't have that many. So we're now looking at the statistics of very right. small. Things. Right, right, right. But, but but the ultimate motivation, the the smallest number, the three people are for environmental concern. Which is kind of interesting. Right. So it's <laughs> not, not, to, not to belittle that argument at all. That wasn't my point. I'm just interested that there are more people who are interested in health and animal welfare and environment. And I think that's partly just lack of it. I mean, I don't know. I don't think most people realize the impact that animals have on the environment. Right. I mean, it's a huge uh, investment of energy and land and water to support one subset of what we eat. And um, in my mind, particularly because now it's having a, a larger impact on the climate as well, sort of if you couple the, yes. the releasing issue plus the cutting down of the rainforest issue to, to do that, you know, it's, it's just, we need to change this. We have to have a change. I'm not necessarily saying everybody needs to stop eating meat. We just need to change how we do how we do agriculture and how we feed people is my mind. Indeed. All right. Should we each have a parting shot? <laughs> so, ahead, so, I, so I think, well, I think, you know, we're largely in, in agreement about almost everything. Um, and I think the only dividing line is that I'm willing to eat a little <laughs> and do my best to make sure it's ethically raised and not environmentally responsible and whatever. And you're just like a couple of inches on the other side right, right, without right. interest, but with the same rationale. Right. If we went back to family farms and, you know, cows not being force fed corn and yep. not having, yep. you know, like thousands of acres of just wall to wall cows where they're all standing in each other's poop and then we're going to, yep. you know, and we're feeding them the wrong stuff. If we just changed how we approached it, I wouldn't have a problem with, you know, the consumption of meat. I just think that we've just, we have just completely messed up our whole agricultural food, food systems, so. Agreed, but we'll have to wait till we are elected into office to make that a difference, right? <laughs> okay. I have no interest. I have less interest in, in running for political <laughs> office than I have in eating meat. <laughs> Nor do I. I want to be. I want to be king, but I don't want to be president or vice president. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. I think we're out of time, and um, it's been a pleasure having you here. And it's lovely to see this interesting chatting that's going on. Um, and I hope if you're in my class, I've gotten your name. Um, I, I'm pretty sure I got everyone's name. Um, so thank you for coming, and and thank you, Elizabeth, for organizing. Yes, this was fun. Yes.